Um, so my um, task today is to introduce the concept of masked polycythemia vera um, and PV and, el and evolution. Um, and I think this is a confusing topic um, still to me. So um, what um, we're going to um, affirm your knowledge that you've gathered the last two days about the definition for polycythemia vera in terms of the WHA WHO 2008 criteria, um, we can define masked polycythemia vera as well, um, and then really try to get at its significance and um, whether it might have implications in terms of revising the diagnostic criteria. And I guess I would just editorialize right here um, that we've had several cases today and yesterday um, that we presented, which were um, supposed to be illustrative of polycythemia vera, and several of them actually never met true criteria um, by WHO, even though in our hearts um, we know that that patient has polycythemia vera, or at least we think so. So um, I'm going to start with, I'm going to have two case presentations, and this was, they're, they're both from my own practice. Um, this was a 65-year-old man who had a new MPN diagnosis. He had been admitted to our trauma service after being struck by a car. Um, hematology became involved because of a leukocytosis and a thrombocytosis. Um, his admission lab was notable for a white count of um, 25,000 with the myelocytes. Hemoglobin was 16.6. MCV was 76. His platelets were 974,000. Um, he was, he, this was major trauma. He had multiple fractures. He had a hemothorax. He was bleeding. Um, and hemorrhaged down to a hemoglobin of, of 6.3, um, requiring transfusions, and, and we saw him in, on the outpatient side after this. Um, he was an active smoker. He had had a history of kidney stones. He did not have a palpable spleen. A bone marrow biopsy um, had been done as well, and he had a ferritin that was post-transfusion that was in the low normal range. His bone marrow biopsy was 70% cellular, um, it was hypercellular, and some marked megakaryocytic atypia, and also some fibrosis. Um, there was no stainable iron, um, and he was chromosomally normal with an, a JAK2 mutation de detected, and it was interpreted as primary myelofibrosis. And just to pause here, I, um, you know, our suspicion was quite high that this patient actually really had polycythemia vera. He wasn't meeting any diagnostic criteria, um, while people with um, myelofibrosis also have a known real risk of both bleeding and thrombosis. Guidelines in terms of um, thrombotic risk prevention are really lacking, um, and we don't typically offer them cytoreductive therapy. Um, and so diagnostically, it was um, important to at least think about this distinction. Um, so um, we could have called him several different things. We can call him um, primary myelofibrosis. Um, he technically gets a few points because of his age. His white count in the setting of trauma was very elevated. Um, but if for most of my patients like this, asymptomatic disease, um, we wouldn't necessarily recommend any therapy. Um, however, um, if he has polycythemia vera, um, he's got about a 5 to even 10 percent risk um, annualized of thrombosis, and, and we know that hydroxyurea might be effective in trying to mitigate this risk. So um, that's, that's sort of one illustrative case. Um, you've seen these criteria already, um, the major criteria. Um, are uh, hemoglobin cutoff, um, and we've seen on several examples um, today um, that this, this hemoglobin cutoff is imperfect and probably um, specific but not terribly sensitive for the diagnosis of polycythemia vera, and then the presence of the JAK2 mutation. Um, bone marrow um, morphology fits into the minor criteria, but you'll notice that it's not required, so a patient um, at least according to the 2008 diagnostic criteria, does not require a bone marrow biopsy for the, um, for the diagnosis of polycythemia vera. Um, and endogenous erythroid colony formation in vitro is one of the minor criteria, um, and I would argue that this is rarely, if ever, used um, in any sort of CLIA-approved um, way. So this is what the WHO book has um, for polycythemia vera. Um, as um, a model 
and um, the um, model is sort of this linear one that perhaps there's this pre-polycythemic stage. Um, you have polycythemia vera um, over a period of time, and then this terminal stage, which is post-PV myelofibrosis um, or uh, AML evolution. Um, and um, the concept of mass PV um, encapsulates some of this. Um, so what is it? And this is sort of a, a semantic discussion. Um, and um, I would say that um, we could say masked, and um, that's, that's what's used. Um, PV and evolution, which actually um, connotes perhaps an early stage of disease. Occult might be the same, same type of um, descriptor. Um, subclinical, um, we might say, I think that would be um, problematic. Smoldering, just to use um, language from some of our other diseases. Pre-polycythemic, again, um, gets this linear um, aspect to it, although um, I would say arguably the case I just presented might be a post-unrecognized polycythemia vera or polycythemia vera in evolution. Um, so this is um, my cartoon of um, masked PV in the context of MPN subtype. So we have this ideal perfect set um, called polycythemia vera. Um, we might have iron deficient PV straddling that um, and evolving polycythemia vera in that sort of linear model. Um, and you know, a few people are gonna be identified early and for that reason maybe not actually meet diagnostic criteria. Um, and then you have post-PV myelofibrosis and I think this part's pretty understandable. Um, there's a central thrombocythemia which has overlap with the evolving PV and iron deficient PV, arguably um, very common um, difficult distinction in younger women, um, but again, as, as Brady pointed out, um, probably a pretty important distinction. Um, and then um, prefibrotic myelofibrosis, um, another kind of difficult to de define entity um, is probably straddling several of these entities. Um, and then, so where does mass PV fit in? And in my construction, it fits in to a lot of these. So I um, think it encapsulates a lot of them. And perhaps all this is is um, a need, as, as really has been um, well documented, I think, over the last few days, um, to be a little bit more inclusive for our polycythemia vera um, diagnostic criteria and maybe include bone marrow morphology, even though I myself don't always use it um, in practice, but it may be more useful. So I could just as easily have presented um, this case, and I think in the interest of time, I won't go through it, but this is um, a, sort of a menstruating woman, younger, um, and probably has polycythemia vera um, on the basis of her bone marrow morphology, um, but she could just as well be called um, prefibrotic myelofibrosis. And um, that's because, and she's not essential thrombocythemia because she's a hypercellular marrow, um, but um, she um, is probably more on the polycythemia vera spectrum. Um, however, um, a, a pathologist might render a diagnosis of prefibrotic myelofibrosis, and it'll take about five minutes for this patient to be on the internet and absolutely freaking out about a diagnosis of myelofibrosis. And I think, um, I, I think this gets to a lot of what we see um, in practice and, and how to perfectly manage it. Um, so just getting to a bit of data, and there's really not a lot. Um, so a lot of um, the um, description of this has been a joint effort between um, the Mayo Clinic and Dr. Teferi and the Italian group um, and they did an international study using their cohort of patients um, and basically um, asked the question of whether bone marrow morphology could serve as a surrogate for red cell mass. Um, and this, you know, I think we also learned that red cell mass is probably no longer to, gonna be in the diagnostic criteria, um, not a very practical test for most of us um, to get, and, but also none of these correlate perfectly hematocrit hemoglobin um, or red cell mass with one another. Um, and so they broke this out into um, 
those patients who met diagnostic criteria for polycythemia vera um, and those who did not, and then looked at thrombosis, progression, survival um, for both um, groups. So I think um, you may have some difficult seeing, difficulty seeing this. Um, as expected, hemoglobin is different because um, one group meets criteria and one doesn't. Um, but what was um, also interesting was to see that um, previous thrombosis um, was um, statistically different, um, arterial um, included, um, as was um, fibrosis in the, in the marrow and palpable splenomegaly. Um, so the outcomes um, are listed here. Um, so time to first thrombotic event was equivalent. Risk of progression to myelofibrosis or acute leukemia was higher in mask PV than over polycythemia vera. Overall survival was worse in the mask PV patients than over polycythemia vera with an annual rate of death in mask PV twofold overt PV. Um, and this was really explained by the evolution to leukemia or myelofibrosis. And uh, looking at a multivariable analysis, um, age, white count, and diagnosis of mass PV were all um, adverse prognostic factors. Um, so um, what um, are the implications? And I would say um, that my interpretation is that perhaps just being a bit more inclusive for the polycythemia vera diagnostic criteria might address a lot of these issues. Um, I think it has a lot of significance for eligibility for clinical trials. Um, and, you know, just uh, hearkening back to the examples that have been used over the last couple of days, um, polycythemia vera is a rare disease. Um, accrual to clinical trials is important. And we um, will often find ourselves um, having to exclude patients because they are not actually meeting diagnostic criteria, even though we're treating them as polycythemia vera. So I, I think that um, probably gets to the important um, features. And otherwise, I think it is um, a pretty heterogeneous group. And what it might be useful for is um, actually sort of legitimizing some of our treatment decisions, um, which might not always correlate um, with the morphologic diagnosis by bone marrow biopsy. Um, so bone marrow um, morphology um, is indistinguishable in mass PV compared to normal PV. Um, hemoglobin values are less than overt polycythemia vera in mass PV. Thrombotic risk is the same. Um, and there's an increased risk of transformation to myelofibrosis and acute leukemia. Um, open questions is um, whether we should treat mass polycythemia vera as a variant of polycythemia vera, and I would argue yes, um, and whether um, I think that calling it smoldering, preclinical, or an evolution is probably inaccurate in terms of descriptors. Um, and it'll be interesting to see um, what happens in terms of the diagnostic criteria for the WHO in 2016. Finally, I would just say that sometimes when we find ourselves in these conundrums, and I think this came up yesterday as well, um, we, f we find ourselves very constrained um, by um, not just major diagnostic um, groups, but actually subgroups. And I think in this molecular age, um, we, we tend to sometimes become constrained by categories. Um, and with that, I will thank you. <laughs>